Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Professor Bill Morgan. I'm the Managing Director of the Lions Eye Institute. It's my tremendous pleasure to welcome you all here to the 22nd Ian Constable Lecture at the University of Western Australia. I also want to acknowledge the land on which we meet tonight, the traditional lands of the Wadjuk, Wadjuk Noongar people, and want to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm just going to say a few words, both about Ian Constable and also about Denial Obrashov, our esteemed uh, lecturer, who we're very pleased agreed to give this talk tonight. Over the years, we've had some incredibly talented I'd say all of them have been incredibly talented lecturers f at the Ian Constable Lecture. Uh, we've even had three Nobel Prize laureates, but irrespective of that, everyone who has spoken has given us insights into parts of life and nature that I don't believe uh, we had before. And tonight's lecture is, is going to be no exception to that. The lecture celebrates the work of Professor Constable who was the founding managing director of the institute, really built up and established the institute, and came out to Western Australia from Harvard at the age of 32 to take up the role in then what was probably perceived as a slight colonial outpost, really. Uh, he could have easily gone back to his native town of Sydney and probably had a bigger name and perhaps done more things there but he fortunately for us chose to come to Perth and we benefited from your Ian, your life's work here in Perth building up the Institute and setting uh, leading from the front in a very charismatic fashion in terms of both clinical work and research proving to us uh, who were younger at the time that it was indeed possible to be a clinician researcher and to do great work in both domains. And also Ian has and had an incredible strategic vision about where ophthalmology could go and how it could really improve services and quality of life to people in this state in particular, but also to people in our near neighbours such as Indonesia. Professor Constable did a lot of work amongst the indigenous people, particularly in the Northwest, and also in Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries. I'm going to finish with our vision, which is better vision for all, which we take very seriously. And Ian really started that and injected, if you like, the DNA into the corpus of the organisation which we carry forwards. Now, I want to introduce Denial Obrashov, who is Associate Professor at ICRA, that's the International Centre for Radio Astronomy, and hails from Switzerland. He has a background in quantum mechanics and then mo moved into uh, astrophysics and has, if you look at his publication record, he's published well over 100 publications in his short life so far. He's also achieved a ARC Future Fellow grant, which, he's, which is no easy feat to, to do. He's also the director of the International Space Centre at the University of Western Australia. I've talked long enough, in fact too long, and without any further ado, I'd like to invite Denial up to the stage to give us his fantastic talk. Thanks very much, Denial. One, two. Hi, good. good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. I, I will start my talk with a, with a slight detour because uh, something rather exceptional has happened at this university this year. Earlier this year, over 100 uh, researchers came, excuse me, over 100 researchers came together with a joint vision, uh, a vision to work together for space, for outer space. We discovered that amongst us, we had an enormous amount of breadth in space relevant research. There are themes like uh, developing rocket propulsion, or making plants grow in microgravity, or shooting up lasers to space for hyperfast communication, or studying the human eye in microgravity conditions, and many, many more themes. 
And we realize that by joining forces, we can become one of the most significant players in the Australian space sector, which is one of the most rapidly growing industries in the country. So we came together and formed what's now called the International Space Centre, uh, which has a, has a vision to accelerate our research in space, to improve our space education for students and externals, as well as to propel our engagement with the industries, governments and the public, like yourself. And I guess we're also going through relatively difficult financial times with uh, COVID mainly. And so part of our vision is also to help out the university and secure uh, new funding streams, uh, external funding streams through uh, industries and philanthropists, as well as government funding streams. So if you are interested in space and the Space Centre, please get in touch and we'll have a lot of exciting news to share with you in the, in the near future. All right, that's all I have to say about this business of the International Space Center. Now, tonight I would like to talk to you about something that is uh, very close to my heart, uh, astrophysics, which uh, I admit is a bit of a tangent to uh, ophthalmology. I, I really am not an ophthalmologist. I have no idea of, of the field. I can hardly pronounce the word. Uh, but as a layman, I'm astonished at the diversity of eyes in nature. Now, genetic analysis has revealed that eyes have evolved at least 20 times independently from simple light sensitive cells. Now, for such a complex organ to evolve 20 times independently, uh, it's got to be very useful. Uh, but interestingly, all the eyes that we find in nature do one thing the same way. They all have a mechanism that takes light from different directions and manages to project that light on different photoreceptors. Okay? So light coming from here goes on one cell, light coming from there goes on a different cell. And that allows you to produce an image. You might say, of course, that's the only way you can make an eye. But think of your ears. The cells that capture the sound, they are not sensitive or barely sensitive to particular directions. You hear me speak with both your ears and yet you can tell where I stand because your brain compares the, the arrival time of the sound wave between your left and your right ear, which is different when I stand here or over there. All right? So why, why can't eyes work this way? You know? Why can't we just take off the lens and then let the photoreceptors compare the arrival time of the light wave and make up the direction where the light came from. Wouldn't that be much easier? Well, the answer is that the speed of light is enormously fast and you would have to be able to measure that difference in the arrival time to a precision which you simply cannot measure using biological systems. So it has never evolved. In principle, physically possible, but has never evolved. So how fast is this speed of light? Well, it is about a billion kilometers an hour. As you watch now, the light is hitting you at a billion kilometers an hour. The measurement of this uh, speed of light, well, it cannot be done by the photoreceptors, but it can be done by intelligent brains nonetheless. And the measurement of this speed has induced one of the biggest revolutions in the history of science. Because as you measure this speed, and I shall now just call it C to avoid the whole number, if you measure this speed, you always measure exactly the same speed. No matter whether you approach the light source or you move away from it. Even if you take the planet Earth that moves very fast around the sun, say towards a star and half a year later away from it, you always measure the speed of the light from that star arrive at the exact same speed. Okay? Same value for that speed. So if you drive, uh, just to make this graphically, at 100 kilometers against the light, you won't measure C plus 100 kilometers an hour, you will just measure straight up C. 
And that, of course, is counterintuitive because you take two cars 100 kilometers each uh, an hour, then uh, the relative speed of these two cars is 200 kilometers. Except if you measure it very precisely, you find that it's a little bit lower. <laughs> it's so much lower that you wouldn't be able to measure and you can, you know, it's justified to ask the question, why bother? Why, why wouldn't we just uh, close the talk here and, and enjoy ourselves outside a bit longer? And, um, you know, say that we have understood nature well enough to do everything we ever want to do. Well, the thing is, if a measurement is different from the theory, at a, at a, at a difference that is larger than your measurement uncertainty, then your theory has to be wrong. Okay? And that might have all sorts of consequences that are much more important than this. Now, understanding what's going on here, of course, is the big challenge. Speed is measured as you know, interval of space traveled per interval of time. So if we have something wrong in our intuition about speeds, obviously we got something wrong in our conception of space and or time. Turns out it's both. And it took these two men, Albert Einstein and Henrik Lorentz, a Dutch, famous Dutch physicist, uh, to, to figure out what's, what's going on. And uh, I just give you the punchline here. So if the two cars are addressed and they both have clocks, these clocks tick exactly at the same speed. So if the car looks at the other car's clock, we'll see that that clock ticks the same as, as his or her clock. And if you have uh, length measurement devices, say rulers in these cars, same story there. They both see each other's rulers being the same. Until one or both cars start moving, in this case, now suddenly they see each other's clock tick, tick at a different speed. Okay, and it's got, got nothing to do with the fact that, you know, there's a little bit of a delay for them to see the light arrive from their clock, even if you're correct for that. Different time in the, in the non-moving object than in the moving object. Different lengths. Worse than that, some of the, of the time of one car is perceived as space. Now what that means is hard to imagine, obviously, it's not that some of this watch suddenly looks like a ruler. It's a bit more, more involved than that. But space appears as time, and time appears as space to the moving observer. So which way does it go? Which clock is slower? Which one's faster? Well, seen from this car, this clock is now suddenly ticking slower. But seen from that car, this one's slower. It's completely symmetrical. Likewise for the rulers. This car sees this ruler shorter than his own one, con contracted, and this one sees this ruler contracted. Now, in honor of Hendrik Lorentz, there is a, a mural in Leiden which displays this. So, what you see here is a round ball, spherical it's supposed to be, or, or a disc shape. And as you move, or as you move the ball, doesn't matter, it's a relative speed, that length will contract in the direction of motion. Okay? Now, obviously, for this to become significant, you've got to be close to the speed of light. That's why we don't see each other contract as we walk around. Okay? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that would be funny. And, and then up there, you have the equation that, uh, that governs this. Um, I've taken the liberty to add little clocks to these disks uh, to show you how they see each other's different, different clocks. Okay? You, you see the moving clock slowed down compared to your own, and if you are with the moving clock, you see the observer's clock slowed down. That is special relativity for you in a nutshell tonight. Okay? And I'm not going to take, talk more about channel, uh, special relativity, but the important takeaway here is that space and time are not what we intuitively think they are. They can morph into each other, they can change, they depend on the reference frame of the observer. And that realization really was what sort of set the ground for an even bigger revolution of understanding the force of gravity. Now, one step back. Isaac Newton, 400 years ago, basically figured out how gravity works. Um, by that I mean he came up with such a perfect theory that we still use it almost everywhere in uh, engineering and science today. You can use 
uh, Newton's equations to build a car, to build a rocket, to fly to the moon, to fly to another galaxy, um, to, to design buildings. Everything you can sort of conceive of, except for some very quirky physics experiments where they break down. But it's an extremely powerful theory that, you know, famously explains in one short equation that you can put on a t-shirt if you like, um, both why the apple falls straight and the moon or any other um, object in orbit goes on a round orbit. Okay? It's not that there are two different laws that make different shapes of orbits. It's one single law applied to a slightly different circumstance gives you a different shape of the orbit. That was the big realization. Before Newton, there were essentially two spheres. One on the Earth, where everything is imperfect and on straight lines and so on, and one uh, a heavenly sphere where everything is on round orbits. Here's one equation that doesn't require a separation. It's one equation for the entire universe. There's one issue, though, that Newton himself realized. Uh, not not, a, not a, uh, a practical issue, but a theoretical issue. And that, I just show you an illustration of this. So imagine you stand on, on the ground and you throw a ball. If you throw as well as me, it goes about that far. <laughs> and now you put a box around you, a, uh, you know, a light, tight, and sound tight box, so that you have absolutely no idea what's going on outside that box. Would you still be able to tell that that box is on the earth? And the answer is yes, because you can still throw the ball and it will still fall down exactly the same way because gravity permeates that ball. And so, you know, you know that you stand on a planet that has exactly one G of gravity and that um, has to be the earth. Except, imagine you were asleep and somebody came and took that box and sneaked it out into space, put it on a rocket, and made that rocket accelerate exactly in such a way that you feel pressed downwards at exactly the same force that pulls me down now. That is possible. You can tune um, a rocket in such a way that you feel exactly one G, no matter how far away from the planet. Okay? Somewhere in the middle of between galaxies, you could have this situation. Now, It is a fact that it is absolutely impossible for this observer to tell in which box he's in or she's in. There's no physics experiment you can conceive of. You know, electromagnetic waves or play with fire or water, whatever you want to do, is exactly the same in both of these boxes. So Newton realized this, and he didn't really know what to do, but he realized it was a problem, because how can it be that two situations are exactly identical for any conceivable experiment and yet they have a completely different description to them. Does that maybe mean that gravity is much more similar to acceleration than we thought? Okay? Now in Newtonian physics of course it isn't and I just show you why not. So the way we would formalize this, if I, if, the, if I was giving a lecture to students, I would now say, let's plot the height of the rocket on the, vertic on the vertical axis above ground, and then time going to the right, and the path of the rocket, I plotted it as the red line. Of course, the rocket's going up, that's why the red line's going up as you go to the right. Now, this, the slope of this line tells you how fast the rocket's going. And because it's accelerating, the slope gets steeper and steeper. Okay, so the curved slope is what makes the acceleration. Okay, that's important. Now, in the other picture, the person just stands on the ground. If you draw the same thing, well, always has the same height above ground. Nothing ever changes there. But you then introduce a force of gravity and you say, well, that force makes up for there being no curvature. Okay? Two completely different explanations yet you feel the same thing. Then Einstein came along and he already was on steroids with space and time morphing into each other. So he said, forget about, that's really clever, forget about gravity, what's going on here is space and time is curved in a way that is hard to imagine, but in such a way that the curvature of this line is exactly the same as the curvature of this line. Okay? So we have now two identical explanations. In both cases, we have a line in space-time that is curved. The only slight difference is that in this case, the whole sheet is curved, 
Well, in this case, um, the line on the straight sheet is curved, but as we shall see mathematically, you can reduce this to being absolutely no difference whatsoever. Okay? So, but no, we, we shall not see that. Um, <laughs> but as can be shown, I should say. Now, nice to come up with such a theory, but of course, unless you have a bunch of equations and some very clear-cut predictions that you can then test, this is not really any better than what Newton had. And that was the genius of Einstein, genius of Einstein to come up with such a, uh, a theory. It took him 10 years of his life. And the first measurable prediction made was that, so we are on planet Earth and we observe a star. Okay? Now this uh, sheet here, that's supposed to sort of represent the curved space time. Uh, it's not quite an accurate representation, but we can measure where the star lies as we are on one side of the sun. And we sort of see the star you know, opposite the sun nicely in the night sky. Then we look at the same star again six months later. As, as the Earth has um, traveled, traveled round, uh, do I have to click again here? Yeah, traveled round to the other side. And you know, now, because of that bent space time, the light is predicted to arrive from a slightly different direction. Much, much less than uh, of a difference that's shown here, but, but measurable, easily measurable to astronomers. And you know, of course, that measurement turned out to be spot on what Einstein had predicted. It got better and better in the years after 1916. And it meant the breakthrough for him in, in his 30s, which is you know, uh, rare for, for famous physicists. Now, given that that's what gravity looks like, so the curvature of space and time, you can actually ask the question, is it possible that you curve a bit more so much that the light, rather than going round, would just sort of go down into that, into that hole. Or otherwise said, imagine the surface of a planet and you have a light source there. Could you make the gravity so strong by having enough mass down there so that the light would just simply come back? That's sort of your classical uh, view. And of course the answer is yes. And when you apply now this theory of space-time to it, uh, the answer is it, it looks like this. Space-time is curved into an infinitely deep hole, and we call that a black hole. Why is it called a black hole? Well, it's called black because no light can get out, so it is actually black. It's called a hole because it is a hole in that space-time fabric. Okay? Very simple word. Astrophysicists use very simple words. Now we call it a black hole, or we call it the Big Bang. Uh, we don't use Latin acronyms. It's all very easy. Now, so we have a theory that says, in principle, such black holes could exist. Doesn't, doesn't, of course, mean that they do exist. And Einstein himself didn't believe that they would for the uh, longest part of his life. And sort of the reason why he didn't is that if you wonder how much mass do you need? For instance, if you had the Earth's worth of mass, how much would you need to compress that mass so that, you know, if you make it smaller, then you get closer to that mass. So that means you feel more gravity. How much would you have to compress the Earth in order to make it such a black hole? And the answer is this, a squash ball. If you can manage to compress the entire Earth into this, you got yourself a black hole. And that thing would now be the mass of the Earth. And, you know, you take a little bit of uh, scrap off with your finger, and that would be the whole Mount Everest. Uh, massive of mass in your finger nail. So if you know of any process to compress the Earth down there that happens somewhere in the universe, then you have a black hole. I just said that that doesn't happen. And, and, and uh, he was right. That, that doesn't happen. We don't know of any such black holes where you have an Earth's mass in such a small space. However, as you go to larger masses, the situation becomes less extreme. So if you take the sun, now you would have to compress the sun roughly, uh, sort of, uh, the diameter would be from here to Fremantle. Now that's, that's a, a lot of compression because the sun is much, much bigger than the Earth, but the density isn't quite as crazy. And if you take many solar masses and you compress them, well, you get to normal densities, things that can actually, you know, you can make of iron or something. So 
If you find a process that brings that much mass together in a close enough space, you can get a black hole. Now, the first empirical evidence for there being black holes, uh, or not the first, but one of the first really conclusive ones, came from the center of our Milky Way. Now, here's a nice view of the Milky Way from the Australian outback, and you see, the, for instance, the Magellanic Clouds, and see so here the band of the Milky Way with dust lanes. When you use a X-ray telescope, sort of machine that you use to check your teeth with a different lens in front of it so that it focuses on the stars, then um, you see that right in the densest part of the stars there's this um, cheeky spot of X-rays. And as you zoom in, you see that the stars are in orbit around that dot of X-ray. So I have now marked the, the X-ray source with a red X, and then all the other uh, points are just optically, with an optical telescope, observed stars over a few years. This movie goes roughly over 15, 20 years. And you see that these stars, they are in orbit around that X. Now, for astrophysicists, that's super exciting. You know, the night sky never looks any different. That's the one thing you have to deal with as an astrophysicist that at the end of the, your life, it looks exactly the same as in the beginning of your life. So if you see something change, you know, on the duration of a PhD, that's amazing. And that's what's going on here. Stars completing entire orbits around the center of the Milky Way. The sun takes 200 million years to get around because it's very far away from that center. But these stars do it quickly. And how can they go around so quickly? Well, they can do so because, well, that X is, is a big mass, and each star gives you exactly the same mass, if you calculate it, and it's 4 million solar masses. And there's so little space that if you compress 4 million solar masses in there, you must have a black hole. And we can't see anything but X-rays. I'll tell you later why we still see X-rays, but essentially nothing there that we can see that's almost certainly a black hole. It was awarded the Nobel Prize three years ago. Another prediction of black holes, actually not just black holes, generally heavy masses, is as they rotate around each other, they not only deform the space-time around them, but they produce these periodic ripples, which in principle we should be able to detect. Because as these ripples come to the Earth, the Earth gets deformed. Now this is heavily exaggerated. Uh, the actual stretching of the Earth of a sort of typical astrophysical event would be less than an atom's diameter on the whole size of the Earth. Okay? So Einstein was aware and he said it's never going to be measurable. Not ever. Because it's just not enough to be ever measured. Uh, but, you know, the next generation say, well, look, maybe uh, we can figure out a way. And over three generations, actually, these crazy optical systems were developed that shoot lasers in different arms and then make them come back and let them interfere. And from that, you can extremely sensitively tell if there has been any length change. And because you use two separate instruments, you sort of compensate for any ground-based um, changes. Of course, the Earth changes constantly by much more than that. Every earthquake, every lightning strike would move things around by much more than an atom's wave. Okay, so you have to be very clever about removing all the ground-based distortions and measure only those coming from space. And even that is not enough. You have to build yourself at least two of those instruments. And only if you receive the same signal on both, then you have some confidence that it was from an extragalactic source. And would you believe, as this system the system they are running, the upgraded good system that they are running now got turned on for the first time on the 12th of September 2015. It took two days for them to capture one of the most strongest events of such a deformation of the planet, just about an atom's wave of the planet. And it came on both detectors, one in Louisiana and the other one in uh, Washington State, a few thousand kilometers apart, arrived at the same time, or only such a small time difference that the speed of light at which those waves travel would just explain the difference. Okay, so essentially at the same time you get the same signal. And they run checks for months to make sure it wasn't just a fluke. You know, the two trees had dropped in exactly the same millisecond. All these sources were 
We have checked uh, by thousands of people to be absolutely sure that this is a gravitational wave. Turns out it is one, and once you have convinced yourself it is one, you can reverse engineer the signal to tell what happened. And the story goes like this. Now this is, this is amazing. 1.3 billion years ago, 1.3 billion light years away, there were two black holes, both much more massive than the sun, tens of times more massive, orbiting each other. And they came closer and closer in because they lost energy due to these waves. And at some moment, they came so close that they coalesced, and within a split second, they emitted an immense such deformation of space-time. The power, the energy power of that um, radiation in that moment was 50 times all the stars in the entire observable universe combined. Okay? You take the 100 billion stars in our galaxy times the 200 billion galaxies there are, all these stars together only produce a 50th of the power of that gravitational wave during that short time where it's emitted. So an unbelievably energetic event. Now that wave races at the speed of light, that deformation, those ripples of space-time race through the universe. And of course, as the, as the sphere gets bigger of that expanding shell, it gets diluted. It gets less and less strong. Okay? And it travels and travels. Now at that time when it was emitted, there was monocellular life on this planet, nothing else. It was, a, it was an early uh, evolutionary stage. There was nothing going on other than single cells floating around. As it traveled, life started becoming more complex. It went through the Cambrian explosion and so on. And as that wave reached the outskirts of our galaxy, humans first appeared on the planet. And then that wave now continues its way through into our galaxy, one star after the other it touches. And then about 100 light years away from our solar system, so when it touched the neighboring stars, you know, general relativity was discovered. And Einstein said, there are these waves, but we can't discover them. And then there's a few more generations that developed these crazy interferometers. And then when the wave was two days away from the planet, they turned on the instrument, and then tuck, it hit, and it, they registered the signal two days after turning on the instrument. Okay? It's got to go there, I'll give you a freeze on, on your back at the, that, that story. Okay? It was emitted when there was n barely anything on the planet, everything happened, and then we measured the thing exactly in the right moment. Of course, you know, have it turned it on, uh, five years earlier, we'd have measured a different run, probably. I don't know. But it's, it is amazing that that's then the thing that you, that you see. Even that isn't the strongest evidence for black holes. Now we come to the, to the heart of those beasts. Black holes are surrounded by material because they act like these cosmic vacuum cleaners. There's always gas somewhere in the cosmos. That gas gets attracted, but it has some spin, so it can't go straight in. It normally settles on a disk that spins, spins around the black hole. And this is a sort of top view of that, the face-on view of that spinning disk. Normally, we, we see that disk uh, uh, more from an angle. And if you were to look at this disk edge-on, it wouldn't just look like a thin sort of line, but it would look like this. Because remember, this is, this is not just a normal disc like a dinner table, a uh, dinner plate. This is a disc with a black hole in the center, and that black hole has the ability to, to distort space in, in unimaginable manners. And what you see up here is, in fact, the disc that's behind the black hole, but the light bends all around so that the disc now appears to be um, on top of the black hole. Likewise, this is the exact same disk from underneath, okay, where the light again bends towards you so that you can see it. So you see these funny, funny uh, figures. Now, it was the astrophysicist's goal for a long time to observe those things. Unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe there aren't big black holes close to us. So you need enormous resolution to measure those. And this is where I come back to that initial thought that in principle you can do vision 
not with an optical lens, but by comparing the arrival time of the light wave to different photoreceptors. Okay? If this had evolved, the eye would be much better than it is. Um, fortunately, we can build those machines and they produce unbelievable resolution, especially if you pull the photoreceptors far apart. And in this case, that was sort of the maximum possible case without flying to space, is using antennas placed all over the globe and combine their radio waves or, uh, yeah, that, that they measure from where we think there is a black hole in a distant galaxy. Now, this, is, this is an image of the galaxy and we now zoom in. We think there is a black hole in the center because as we, as we zoom in with optical telescopes we see these jets spewing out and they become more and more apparent as you have apply better resolution with your optical telescope. Almost certainly that comes from a black hole. So that um, superb machine of many telescopes was put to look exactly at, what going on, at what's going on on the, on the scale of the black hole. We think from other measurements that the size of the black hole is about this size, exactly what it looks like. Now it's not a very good uh, image by all, by all means, it's a bit of a, of a crappy image, but uh, it, it still is amazing. It's, uh, you know, the resolution I think allows you to read the newspaper in Sydney, so something like that. Um, this picture was featured all over the news, I'm sure you, many of you have seen it. But what they often didn't show you is what, the, what now the model looks like. And see this is now how this actually maps onto that, um, onto that model. Okay? It's just a blurred version of such an inclined disk. Now hopefully over the next few years the resolution will increase maybe by a factor two, maybe by a factor three. Okay? And you will see a lot, a lot more than in that early image. Good. Now, so I hope I have convinced you that there are such things as black holes. We've seen the gravitational waves. We've seen them almost directly. Uh, we've seen the stars sloshing around in the orbit of these black holes. So let's go and visit one. Now, we're gonna, gonna do this in sort of uh, two ways. First of all, we watch an astronaut as she falls towards a black hole and we are in a spaceship and we don't go down. We, we stay safe and afterwards we go down ourselves. And there are two completely different views. So as we hover in our spaceship and we, we send her off and she falls towards that black hole, what we see strangely is that she doesn't get faster but slower and slower and slower. And also she gets sort of red and dim and at some stage she completely fades away. We never see her go in. That is because seen from us, time slows down to zero at the horizon of the black hole. Okay, if she has a clock, that clock goes more slowly and slowly and slowly. That's not how it feels for her, but that's how we see that clock go. It would literally take an infinity of time to see her go into the black hole. Now, because the time gets stretched in that way, the light that gets emitted from her becomes longer in wavelength. Okay? because uh, the color of light is how many times per second the light oscillates. So blue light becomes red light as your clock slows down. So that's why she turns red, but doesn't stop there. She then becomes infrared and millimeter waves and radio waves and so on. And at some stage, the wavelengths are larger than the scale of the universe. You'd never be able to detect them anymore. She literally has disappeared on the horizon of the black hole. Now, Let's go ourselves. And we now stand on the black hole and we, can, we have a, a view up and a view down. Well, what, where is the black hole? Of course, the black hole will be down. I say this is down because the gravity pulls me down. Okay, the Earth is where down is. Same, when you are close to a black hole, you would say that down is where the black hole is. That's how it would feel. Okay, so the down view is where the black hole is. And as we go closer and closer, we now see that the entire universe around us uh, warps around us and comes above us into a single point. Okay? I may just go back and show you the same thing one more time. So I've been talking too much. So, 
Oops, go back. Come on. Lost it. Good. It's a tricky video because it starts very slowly. Anyway, um, I can't get it to play again. It doesn't matter. So the entire universe wraps around you and closes in above you as you approach the black hole. Okay? And not only that, you see here, it gets totally blue because all the light that comes down becomes blue in exactly the same way that her light became red to us. So it accelerates as it falls down, which, of course, the speed of light doesn't change. But what acceleration in this case means is that it picks up energy. So uh, its frequency becomes higher and higher, becomes bluer and bluer, becomes UV light, okay? Light, but even more cu um, curiously, as we look up in the universe, the time in that universe accelerates. And if we have a strong telescope and you, we look back at planet Earth, what we literally see, and this is not just some crazy thing that you would see that if you sent a telescope there, you would see that the Earth goes around the sun at this speed, and faster and faster, and the years go this way, past. Okay, and as you fall into the black hole, you see thousands and millions of years elapse up there. Of course, you'd never be able to go back and tell the story. But that's how you will perceive time. While the other ones, of course, just see you stop. Because in one year for them, you don't do anything. Because they've been so fast to you. Okay? So you now see the entirety of time and the entirety of space concentrated in this one point and at this one moment. And then you cross the horizon and you approach what we call the singularity, the center of the black hole, so to speak, where every theory of physics breaks down. It's just, uh, you know, things blow up. You get divisions by zero and all sorts of funky things where we suspect that simply it's the end, the limits of the reach of the theories of the universe we have. Okay? And it's at this stage where I like to quote Carl Sagan, who said, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Thank you very much. Did you want to moderate questions? Or? Yeah, good. Denial, that was an absolutely fantastic talk. Um, I think you can all see why we're fascinated with space. And there's so much Denial could talk more about, if you like, applications of space to Earth. And that's what attracted us, the Institute, to the International Space Centre. Um, so much of our research has come from pure curiosity and I think you can see that this is what really motivates denial. It motivates a lot of our researchers and the spin-offs are enormous. I'm going to open up for questions. Would anyone like to ask denial, don't ask me, please ask denial <laughs> a question on uh, what you've just been listening to. Graham Mann from Murdoch, please. Uh, as, a, as an astronomer, what do you hope might be discovered using such a fantastic mm -hmm. instrument? So Graham's asked, um, for, in, in essence, I think for Denial's vision for what will come out of the square kilometre array both here in the Murchison and in South Africa. Thanks. Yes, well, so, so the square kilometre array, to, to quickly brief you, is, is a project we can all be proud of. Uh, you know, it, it is a massive astrophysical facility deployed in Western Australia. Uh, billion dollars at least worth of uh, partially local investment, partially international investment, and it's going to, it's being built as we, as we speak after very, very many years of, uh, of development behind the scenes. I came to Australia for this particular project 10 years ago. Now, we scientists like to make science cases. Okay, the question was what the discoveries will be 
the exciting ones. We like to make science cases where we predict the discoveries. It seems a little bit ironic, but, but that's how there's a 2,000 page long book that tells us the amazing things that we can do. And if we just do those things, it is incredible. For instance, we will see the first galaxies in the universe form. The first stars light up the otherwise dark cosmos. After the Big Bang, the, the, which was very bright, the universe went through an extremely cool period where nothing much was happening until the first stars exploded and they reionized the entire gas around them and everything become, became shiny again. We'll see that particular period because that's so far away that the wavelengths of the light have changed uh, on the path so much that you have to see those things in radio waves. That's one cool thing. Another thing is we will be able to zoom into um, disks around newborn stars where planets are now forming. Okay? So the search for life, for instance, in the cradle of life is the title of the science case. And those are the sort of things that excite me enormously. Now, with all big astronomy facilities built in the past, when you look back at what, the, what their big merit is, it's never a good match to the science case. The Hubble Space Telescope, most famous telescope there is probably in the public eye, had a science case with 10 top science goals. Only two of them are now in the top 10 discoveries of the, square, of the Hubble Space Telescope. So what I want to say by this is what really excites me are the unknown, unknown kind of things. Um, because we just open up parameter space that has never been explored. We basically give humanity a new eye um, that just sees a part of the world that nobody's ever seen. So what excites me is the, is the surprise. Erica Smythe. Yeah, yeah. And are they all black, related to black holes, or are there other events that are producing detectable gravity waves? That is a really good question. Yes, many, many such events have now been detected. Um, I, would, I don't have the latest counts, but it might be of order 100. Now, the instrument hasn't been on the whole time. It, it gets taken down for new upgrades and so on. So the frequency at which we make these detections, I say we, meaning everybody except for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we make these detections. Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. But they are not all black hole, black hole mergers. Some of them are. Many, most of them are actually, but most of them are lighter black holes than the ones that were observed there, but a bit more close to us so that the wave isn't all that diluted by the time it gets here. But there have also been very interesting events where a black hole merged with a neutron star or two neutron stars collided. They are very interesting because since there aren't black holes yet, you can actually see them. And if they produce anything else but gravitational waves, you ought to see those signatures as well. So, of course, when those things were discovered, when you look at the gravitational wave and you say, oh, that, that wasn't a black hole, that looks just like a neutron star, <laughs> then you look through all the archival data of the big telescopes or in all the, the possible wavelengths and you try to find the thing. And there have been cross-identifications of such events where exactly in the same second other things were observed. We now call that multi-messenger astronomy as an extension to multi-wavelength where we have the optical spectrum plus the whole gravitational wave spectrum. So yeah, it is a very active field. I mean, if you were to start a PhD in astrophysics today, I would probably gravitate towards this or extrasolar planets. I mean, these are you know, extremely dynamic kind of, kind of fields. Yeah. Okay. Ian. Now, is, a, is a black hole an end point? Can it evolve into something else? Uh, or is that, that the finish of that, that cluster of, uh, of stars and, and constellations? Yeah. So, so Ian is asking if a black hole is, is the end of the story for the matter of the black hole. Or if it can still evolve, it can become a star again or so. No, a black hole is basically it. Now, I say basically because there is an interesting quantum mechanical effect that um, happens on the horizon of the black hole where particles can be created 
and in pairs, and one, pair fall, one part falls into the black hole and the other one escapes. And by this process, gravitation, uh, uh, black holes slowly lose some of their mass. We call it the evaporation of black holes. Now, for one of these black holes that we spoke about to evaporate like this, you would have to wait 10 to the 100 years, which is 10 to the 90 times the age of the universe. I, if that doesn't mean anything to you, it is almost infinity. <laughs> okay? So, in a practical sense, yes, they are the end point. But there is this scenario that eventually the entire universe will be in black holes, and then we just have to wait for that long until all the black holes are gone. <laughs> and, you know, you can wait for that long if there's nobody to care. <laughs> Sorry, we have a question from up the back. I'm Hi. wondering, are there any cool applications or discoveries on Earth that since sensing gravity waves that have been made, like particularly relevant uh, fields that it's applied to? Uh, sorry, particularly. So, so, so I think he's, uh, you're asking if there are any, in effect, applications or secondary insights that are applicable to yeah. matters closer to Earth from studies of gravitational uh, waves. Right. Uh, well, look, that, that, is a, that is a tricky question. I mean, yes. always with these projects, you have a ton of spin-offs. You know, this is the most precise measurement device ever built by any stretch of the imagination. There is laser technology, mirror technology, stabilization technology in there that has enormous uh, reaches of applications already now. Now, in terms of understanding the theory and then applying that theory to new devices, I, I wouldn't say so. So far, the gravitational waves have only confirmed general relativity. Okay? So we are, we are more positive now that this theory is true even in very, very extreme gravitational regimes. Uh, so it's given us confidence, but you know, it's, not, it's not given us a new particle that we can manufacture something of. But the development of the machines, of course, have, have yeah, tremendous um, spin-offs. Is that answering your question? Cool. Uh, Shane Maloney has a question. Shane. Oh, that is a good question. So, uh, that, that, that's a question that's loaded of, of premises. Uh, the universe is, of all the matter in the universe, most is so-called dark matter, which we, we cannot see, but we can detect through its gravitational effect. Our galaxy, all the stars in the Milky Way, wouldn't stay together if there weren't about five times more mass in a dark form. And we know a lot about where it is and how it shapes, but we just don't know what it's made of. And so a clever question is, is it just a bunch of black holes that we cannot see? It could be few very large black holes or gazillions of very small black holes, perhaps formed during the Big Bang. All these ideas have come up you know, thousands of times in, in astrophysics. astrophysics. And over the last 50 years, every single mass range of black hole candidates has been excluded from this. So there's no way that there are so many black holes to explain even a you know, small fraction of the dark matter, and we don't see these black holes. Because the black holes, they produce gravitational lenses, they, they, they fly through gas, and you would see that gas fall in and produce x-rays. They would um, pull stars out of their orbits. All these effects are seen, but never at the level that is anywhere near what's needed. So no, black holes are ruled out as um, candidates. Unless something very exotic is going on where there are, say, you know, nanometer-sized black holes or something, something like that, which no, nobody has any idea how those things would ever come about. Got any questions? Ah, up the, right up the back. Thank you. What happens to the asteroid which you begin to be black hole? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, a good question. So, once, once you go through that horizon, 
and the entire space and time of the rest of the universe is now in this one point above you, then um, you are going towards that singularity where time ends. Okay, that's what the theory says. And there's just no, no escaping from that thing. You cannot, uh, you, have, you have a limited amount of time in case of the Milky Way's black hole. It's roughly 20 minutes after going through the horizon that you probably survive. Uh, well, yeah, for some time, and then time ends. Now, don't ask me what that means. Um, I, I just don't know. I have forgotten, though, to tell you the really interesting story of what it feels like to actually fall into the black hole other than just time and space. Because, you know, if you pick a smaller black hole, say a sun-sized black hole, you have a real problem. Because as you approach the black hole, not only is the gravity strong, but it is stronger at your feet than at your head. And that is very uncomfortable. So you get, you get pulled. And at the same time, you get these forces that pull you, um, you know, press you together from the side. It's basically going to a funnel that stretches you and pushes you together. And at some stage, the difference in force between your feet and your head is so strong that it um, succumbs the intermolecular forces that hold your body together. And so you snap. And now you are two pieces. And then these two pieces go through the same process and become four and eight and 16 and so on until you are a string of atoms going into the black hole. Guess what astrophysicists call this? Spaghettification. Uh, there we go. That happens when you, choose, when you choose a small black hole, like the solar mass black hole. That happens well before the horizon. So you don't get to see any of that time acceleration. So, so by all means, if you choose to die in a black hole, pick a massive one. Because then you get to go through the horizon just fine. And you're almost at the singularity when you become a spaghetti. Okay. It almost uh, raises almost theological questions, doesn't it? In terms of time ending as one approaches a certain point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a particular question, but I want to know if anyone else in the audience has a question. I know that Denial's particularly interested in bubbles, and bubbles, my very simplistic notion of a collapsing bubble is it's almost like a, a mini um, energy black hole collapsing in. D Denial, do you mind commenting on whether there's any similarity in the effect of gravity and bubbles? And I know you've thought about this and have uh, written about its potential linkages to cavitation bubbles. We have quite a few engineers in the audience who I think would be most interested in your thoughts on this. Uh, okay. <laughs> Brief, briefly, this is quite technical, but um, <laughs> I'm talking about cavitation bubbles. Cavitation bubbles are essentially empty bubbles in water, and you get them in all sorts of um, um, hydrodynamic devices. They destroy your ship propellers if you run them for long enough. They, they can be used in inkjet printers. They can be used to destroy cancer cells. They, um, they, they annoy the Swiss in the electric power stations. Anyway, there are these bubbles that are sometimes good, sometimes bad, and the reason they are both good and bad is that they can concentrate a lot of energy in a, almost a single point. If you um, take a bunch of water and you cut out the sphere, make a vacuum sphere, and now you apply, uh, apply simple um, equations that we have to deal with water flows, the Navier-Stokes equations, you find that this thing will collapse immediately. It's a vacuum, will collapse onto, that, onto itself, and will reach infinite speeds. Okay, that's what you get when you apply Navier-Stokes equations. Now, of course, nature doesn't like infinities. It will invent all sorts of things to avoid this. The water will, um, will, the molecular nature of the water will become important. It will heat up, it will produce shock waves, it will get compressed, it will do chemical reactions. You imagine, um, it happens all in this one point because uh, nature has, has to avoid the infinity. Now, the exact same thing, or not exact, but very similar happens at the end of the life of a big giant star where the star essentially has no more stuff available in its center to fuse. And so it cannot shine anymore. And what that means, it doesn't have the heat 
and the pressure anymore that helps it support itself against its own gravity. Okay, if you suddenly turn off that oven inside a star, the star suddenly feels that now the whole gravity is pushing in and the center of the star collapses in a very similar fashion. It also, um, according to simple equations, reaches um, infinite densities and so on. And what in real life happens is you get a black hole. Okay? That's nature's way to avoid infinity. Okay? In Newtonian theory, uh, you get infinities. In Einsteinian theory, you get a black hole. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good question. So the lady at the front saying is, is perplexed by the notion that if it involves the end of time, then it's not, um, in a sense, some of the movement cannot be infinite. I think that's my understanding of the yeah. question. Yeah, and I mean, that's, in a way that's what I'm trying to say. I mean, the black hole is, is nature's way of avoiding the infinity. <laughs> Denial, it's been an absolutely fabulous evening. Thank you so much for your time coming to join and speak with us. We have a small gift for Denial. Oh. I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. I need to see an eye doctor. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And also, please thank your family for sparing you for an evening. Uh, Donal's got delightful young children and they've given him permission to come and speak with us for the night. Thank you very much, Donal. Thank you very much. Thank you.